during the lockdown, you know, I'd often uh, see on Facebook Christians objecting to certain measures, certain restrictions taken by the state. And I would see posts that would say things like, hair salons are open, but not churches. Liquor stores are open, but not churches. Rightly showing certain of the absurdities and some of the restrictions. But I have a friend on Facebook who identifies as a Christian who does not go to church, who does not belong to a church. And he also posted something similar, something like, oh, beauty salons are open, but not churches. And I thought to myself, well, what do you care? You don't go to church. What difference does it make to you? For you, nothing changed over these past three months. As far as church is concerned, nothing changed. It didn't change any of your plans. It didn't change any of your routines. It didn't change anything because you don't go. You wouldn't even know the churches are closed unless someone told you because you don't go. There's a lot of people. I know, I personally know a lot of people who identify as Christians, and I'm not talking about Greek Orthodox, I'm talking about evangelicals, who identify as evangelical Christians who yet do not go to church, do not belong to a church. Now, there are some theological issues. I understand there are some theological issues that are difficult. There are some theological issues that are hard to really know what the Bible teaches on these. Um, and you need a lot of conversation, and you need a lot of study, and, you, and sometimes you end up not being 100% sure what the Bible teaches on this subject, because there are some difficult things in the Bible. This is not one of those cases. Being part of church is basic Christianity. Um, the New Testament clearly commands believers to be part of a church. The New Testament takes as a given that believers are part of a church. The entirety of the New Testament falls apart if you took away the church. If you went, if you were living in the first century and you went up to the apostles or any Christian basically in the first century and you said to them, I'm a Christian, do I need to go to church? They would look at you like you're from a different planet. They wouldn't know what you're talking about because it's two sides of the same coin. Christians are part of a church. That, that's just how it is. It boggles my mind when I find people who supposedly are evangelicals and read their Bibles, but don't see the importance of being part of a church. What does the word church mean? Because in English, the word church is kind of weird. Where does it come from? I've read different and differing opinions as to where the word comes from. So never mind the word church in English. The Greek word that we find in the New Testament, ekklesia. What does ecclesia mean? Well, some people like pointing to the roots of the word, the etymology of the word, and they say, well, ek comes from exo, which means out, and ecclesia is from klesi, which means a call, and so it's those who have been called out. And so a lot of people make a lot of, a lot of Christians point out that the church is those who have been called out from the world and things like that. But we don't even have to go that far into where the word comes from. 2,000 years ago, it was very simple. 2,000 years ago, the word ecclesia simply meant a gathering. That's what ecclesia means, a gathering, okay? Uh, it, for a long time, I've thought, to myself, I've thought that the word church is not the best translation because most people just hear church and they think of building. Well, and of course, that's not what it means at all. Um, there are three words, English words, that I think would be better translations than the word church for ecclesia. Here they are. Gathering, 
congregation or assembly. Either one of those is a perfect translation for the word ecclesia. Okay? Uh, in fact, um, if, you're, if you go to Acts 19, don't go there right now, but in Acts 19, where Paul is in Ephesus and there's a big riot in the streets because Paul was saying that be, Ephesus was a very religious city and Paul was teaching against idolatry and so they got really upset and they caused a big riot and it talks about this huge crowd that was going out into the streets yelling great as Artemis of the Ephesians and if you read it in the Greek it talks about that crowd and calls it Ecclesia. It's not a Christian church it's a gathering of people that's what Ecclesia means. It's a gathering. It is a group of people who gather together. That's what Ecclesia means. A Christian church is a group of Christians who gather together. It is a gathering, a congregation, an assembly. Okay? Sometimes, the response by people who claim to be Christians but don't go to church not part of a church. They respond by saying, well, I don't need to be part of a local church. I'm part of the universal church. Okay, what do they mean? Well, it's true that sometimes, not often, but sometimes in the New Testament, Ecclesia is used for the totality of all believers, all Christians of all time are sometimes called the church, okay? For example, Matthew 18, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, okay? He's talking about all Christians of all time, the church that he is going to build as a whole. He's not talking about a specific local church in that passage, he's talking about the universal church. And so the word church can sometimes be used in that sense. And so some say, well, we're Christians, but we don't go, we're not part of a local church, but we are part of the universal church. A couple of problems with that. Number one, even those who, are, those who are part of the universal church, which is all Christians, are still to be part of a local church. <laughs> um, if, you, if you look into the, into the New Testament, you find the word ecclesia a bit over a hundred times. 95% of the time, that's a large group, okay? 95% of the time, the word ecclesia is referring to a local assembly, not to the universal church. It's very rare. There's a couple of verses, but not many. It's very rare that it's referring to the universal church. The vast majority, over 90, 95% of the time, when you read about Ecclesia, it's talking about a local group of believers. That is the normal way that the word Ecclesia is used in the New Testament. A group of believers who gather together. And so, when I find a person who says, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church, he's in essence saying, well, I'm part of the congregation, that's what Ecclesia means. I'm part of the congregation, but I don't congregate. I'm part of the assembly, but I don't assemble. I'm part of the gathering, but I don't gather. It kind of breaks down, doesn't it? It doesn't make much sense. It's foolishness. The Bible is very clear concerning the church. It's basic Christianity. It's not some difficult, abs it's not some difficult, complex issue. It's basic Christianity. Let's take something else that's basic Christianity. Prayer. Let's assume that you met someone who said, I'm a Christian, but I don't pray. You don't pray? No, I don't pray. Are you saying that you sometimes find it difficult to pray? No, no, I just don't pray. Are you saying that sometimes it's difficult to concentrate or that you fall asleep or something? No, 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 I, I just don't think you need to pray. But what about all the passages in the Bible that talk about prayer? Eh, just skip them, I guess. Just skip them. 
Ignore them. Well, the same thing goes with the church. I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. What about all the passages that talk about going to church? Uh, I'm just Skip them, I guess, right? I guess. Well, where does the Bible tell us to go to church? Show me a verse, Nico. All right, I'll show you a verse. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. What's the book of Hebrews about? Uh, it's written to Hebrew people who identify as Christians, but they have a lot of trouble. What's the trouble that they have? Well, remember, Hebrew people who became Christians back in the first century were considered heretics by their fellow Hebrews. And so there was great persecution against Christians, Hebrew Christians, who other Hebrews thought that they were traitors to the faith and were following the fake Messiah. And so there was great persecution against Hebrew Christians by other Hebrews. And let's not forget that soon after that, because that's how Christianity began, but soon after that, um, being Jewish, being Hebrew in the Roman Empire in the first century, towards the end of the first century, being Jewish was perfectly legal. There was no problem, but it was illegal to be a Christian. Okay? So, some of these Hebrews who identified as Christians were considering abandoning the faith. Go, let's just go back and be Jews the way that we were, because it's safer. It's safer than to be a Christian. Now, it would be perfectly understandable. I'm not saying it would be perfectly right. It's not right, but it would be perfectly... I get it. I get it. It's perfectly understandable if these people said, you know what, I'm not going to go to church because it's too dangerous. It's like putting a target on my back. It's like saying, I identify with the heretics. All right? I don't, I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to have trouble. It's too dangerous. I'm not going to go to church. I'll just stay home. Okay? It's not right, but I understand if that was their thinking. Yet the writer to the Hebrews does not say, well, if that's the case, that's fine. Just stay home. It's not what he says. He doesn't say you don't need to go. Instead, what does he say? Look at, let's look at uh, Hebrews 10, verse 23. The writer says, let us hold fast, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He says, as things get difficult, we need each other even more. We need to encourage each other. We need to exhort each other. We need to stir up, he says, love and good works. It's very easy to just, let's leave it all. Just let's just go hide somewhere. Let's not get into this too much. No, we need to exhort one another. We need to encourage one another. Remain faithful. Uh, how does he say it? Hold fast to our confession. Let's stir up love and good works. How should we do this? By not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as some have done. There are some people who have stopped coming. Don't be like them. Keep on gathering. Keep on meeting together so we can help one another and encourage one another and remain faithful. Continue going to church. Don't stop, is his point. If you're a Christian, you say, I'm a Christian, I don't go to church. You read that verse. Hmm? Just skip it, I guess. Just skip it. Ignore that. Skip it. Just move on. There are many Sunday mornings as we're getting ready to come to church or as we leave the house and we're going to the car, we, you'll smell incense burning somewhere or you'll hear chanting, not that a person is chanting, but like a radio or a TV station or something like that. What's this person doing? Well, they're a Greek Orthodox person who doesn't want to go to church. And so instead, what are they doing? They're pretending to be in church by having the chanting and having the smells, 
because then it seems like church. Okay, it's not, they're not really going to church, but they're pretending to be in church. And I always kind of find that silly and funny. But evangelicals do the same thing. For a Greek Orthodox person, church is the chants and the incense. For an evangelical, church is a sermon and hymns. And so there are many evangelicals who are like, I'm not going to go to church, but what will they do on Sunday morning? We'll listen to a sermon online or we'll listen to some hymns. Now, if you can't get to church because you're sick or something, I understand. But I'm talking about people who are very well able to do so, but instead we'll just pretend to be in church by not actually gathering. I'll just by myself listen to a sermon and listen to some hymns. And it's the same thing. It's not church. You're not assembling. You're not congregating. You're just listening to some stuff. I have a friend on Facebook, different friend this time, not the same one that I mentioned earlier. I have a friend on Facebook. I don't know the details of her church life, but from the little that I do know, she certainly doesn't go to church regularly. And I remember one Sunday morning, she had posted a sermon on Facebook. And she was like, oh, this is, this is a great sermon, you need to hear it. And you could clearly tell that she had not gone to church on Sunday morning, rather she had heard this sermon from a very famous preacher that she loved. She would listen to sermons by him all the time. And so obviously that Sunday morning she had, morning she had not gone to church. She had heard this great sermon and so she decided to share it and post it online. And she said, listen to this great sermon by my pastor so-and-so. And I thought to myself, no. He is not your pastor. He doesn't even know your name. You don't go to his church. He is not your pastor and you're not going to church. I'm sure she'd learned a lot of things from this person, but this is being foolish now. Speaking of pastors and congregants, and since we're in Hebrews, you just turn the page, just a couple of pages to the last chapter, chapter 13. Hebrews 13. These are just the closing admonitions that you often find at the end of letters. Hebrews 13, verse 17. The writer says, Obey those who rule over you. Speaking about in the church now. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And there are many passages we could look to. I just went to this one because it's close to the previous passage. There's a lot of passages we can look at that talk about the relationship between elders and the church and pastors and the people within the church and so forth. If you're a Christian, who doesn't go to church. What do you do with all these pastors who talk about the relationship with your pastor or with your elder? Skip them. Well, I don't have a pastor. I don't have an elder. I'm not part of church. Skip it, skip it, just skip it. You don't need to talk about those. In fact, in the New Testament, there are three letters, first and second Timothy and Titus. And these three letters are called the post, we call them the pastoral epistles. Why? Because Timothy and Titus were pastors. Titus was a pastor in Crete and, Ti and Timothy was, church history tells us that he was a pastor in Ephesus. Okay. And so Paul writes these letters, first, second Timothy and Titus, and he is telling these men how church should be done. He gives them criteria for what, how, how, how you to, to, uh, to have elders, how to have deacons. He tells instructions about how the church is to function and so forth. If you don't go to church, can we just skip those three books altogether? Just skip the entirety of the three books because it's all about church and how church should relate, how people in church should relate to one another and so forth. So it's just, Skip those com complete three books because they're pointless. They don't matter because I don't go to church, right? We can just skip them. We don't need 27 books in our New Testament. We can just have 24. Never mind the one that talks about going to church. 
and relating to other people in church because we don't go to church. A little while back, we were going through 1 Corinthians. We were going through 1 Corinthians for a long time, a year and a half, because it's a big book. And in that book, Paul was talking about so many things that were going on in that church. It's not about one main issue like Galatians. It's, it's a book that talks about many different subjects. And they all have to do with the church and how things are supposed to be done within the church. And I was thinking about some of the things that we talked about back in 1 Corinthians. The Lord's Supper. We can skip that, right? Because you can only have the Lord's Supper if you go to church. You don't have the Lord's Supper on your own at home. Let's just skip all that. He talks about uh, spiritual gifts and how the purpose of spiritual gifts is not so that you can have a gift for yourself. It's so that you can edify and build up the church. Skip those. It talks about head coverings. Whatever your position is on head coverings, it doesn't really matter because it's about church. Skip that. Chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians talks about excommunication, removing someone from church. What's excommunication? Who gets excommunicated? Who gets excommunicated? The person who wants to be in church, but because of blatant and unrepentant sin, the church is forced to say, no, you can't be part of us anymore. Okay? And the person is excommunicated. How should we view a person who voluntarily chooses not to be part of the church? Because it's a terrible thing, it's an awful thing to have to remove someone from church, to excommunicate them. How do you excommunicate someone who has basically excommunicated himself? Right? He says, I don't belong there. I'm not going to go there. What do you do? Just skip all those passages. Just skip them all. Don't think about those things. Because they're not part of the church. In fact, the vast majority of New Testament letters are written to what? Churches. Right? It's the letter to the church in Thessalonica. It's the letter to the church in Corinth. It's the letter to the churches in Galatia. In fact, even the book of Revelation is a letter to seven churches in Asia Minor. Okay, these are letters to churches. So to the person who says, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I say, I say to them, if you lived 2,000 years ago in Thessalonica, and Paul sent First and Second Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonians, you know that you didn't get that letter. It wasn't intended for you, because you're not part of the church. It was sent to the church, not you. If you lived in Corinth 2,000 years ago, and you were not part of the church when the two letters came, they don't apply to you. They're not for you. They were for the church, and you're not part of the church. So if these letters weren't intended for you then, why do you think they're intended for you now? They're written to churches. We just skip them too. Just skip all the letters. Let's just skip all the letters that are written to churches, shall we? You know what? We don't need 27 books in the New Testament. We'll just have like 10 of them or something. Just skip all the rest because they're about being part of a church. The entirety of the New Testament is based on the fact that believers gather as a church to worship. The entirety of the New Testament takes that as a given. Let me give you another thing. The language that the New Testament uses very often for Christians is not individualistic, but communal. For example, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and you are the flock. We're a group of sheep. Um, God is our father and we are brothers and sisters. We're a family. Christ is the head, and we are the body, the members individually of a body. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter talks about how each one of us are 
living stones that are put together to build a holy temple unto the Lord. All of these images, and there's more we can look at, all of these images are that of a group, a gathering, a community, a church. I was contacted once by a lady. I guess she saw Baptist Church, and so she contacted me and she said, you're Baptist Church, right? Yes. Um, would you baptize me? I, pretending to be naive, said, won't your pastor baptize you? Oh, I don't have a pastor. Oh. Do you go to church? No. Okay. Are you planning on joining our church? No. Are you planning on joining some other church? No. Why do you want to get baptized? She says, well, the Bible says so. Well, the Bible also says to go to church. Why do you think you should obey the one and not the other? Hmm, I don't know. You know, the biblical pattern, I told her, is you get saved, you get baptized, and you become part of the church. You, you don't want to do that? No? She's like, so you're not, not going to baptize me, are you? <laughs> Let me show you one passage. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. It's a very famous passage. It's the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit has come upon the 120 believers who are there. And uh, the Apostle Paul is filled, uh, excuse me, the Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter is filled with the Spirit. And he tells the crowd, he gives the gospel to the crowd. He tells them that they killed the Messiah and they believe it. And they're cut to the heart. And they say, what should we do? We've killed the Messiah, what should we do? And he says, repent and get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. All right? So they received the word of Peter, and they got baptized, as they should. And there's about 3,000 of them added now. Okay, so it used to be 120 believers. Now it's 3,120 believers. Well, what do these people do? Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So it's not like, yay, 3,000 people got saved, now everyone just go home. No. From that moment on, they would gather for fellowship, kinonia, it's community, and they would listen and get taught the apostles' doctrine, teaching, and they had prayers, and they had breaking of bread. That could be either reference to eating together, or it could be a reference to the Lord's Supper, or both. But it's a, suddenly you have a community of people who gather to share their lives and learn about God and worship God together. And at the end of this passage, if you go to verse uh, 47, Look in the middle, the last sentence of the chapter, the middle of verse 47. It says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So there were more than these 3,000. 3,000 were the ones who got saved on the day of Pentecost. But after that, you have even more people who are getting saved. And what happens when they get saved? They're added to the church. That's what it says. Okay, and when it says they're added to the church, what's it talking about? It's talking about the Jerusalem church, the local church. It's not talking about some universal church. You're automatically part of the universal church the moment you believe. So that's not what it's talking about here. These people got saved and they were added to the local church. That's what they did. That's the pattern. I've never understood. When the Lord saved me, I was listening to tapes from the other side of the world. Here's what happened, let me tell you. I was, the Lord saved me 
through certain tapes that I was listening to that found their way across the world and I was listening to these sermons. And soon after I was saved, I was listening to these, to, I was listening to a sermon and the pastor in the sermon said something like, he addressed someone in the congregation. He said something to someone and either the person replied or someone laughed, I don't remember, but I, I heard the people in the congregation and the light went off and I thought to myself, oh, this is not just a guy giving a speech. There's a church there. It's people. It's a group of people there. And I thought, I'm here by myself listening to tapes when I could be part of a group of people who we all believe the same things and worship together. And I don't have that. And I very soon wanted to be part of a church. And so I've never been, I've never had the mindset of, I don't want to be in church. So I, it's difficult for me to understand all these people who say, well, we're Christians. But we don't care about going to church. I don't really understand it. Let me close with this story that I read. I, um, I was reading the Confessions by the great Saint Augustine. As we all do, reading the Confessions of Saint Augustine, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you were reading that the other day, weren't you? Yes. Saint Augustine, who lived a millennium and a half ago, and he tells a story in the, in the Confessions. He mentions two men. One of the men that he mentions is a man named Simplician, and Simplician was a, a teacher, a pastor. He was, one, he was like a mentor to Saint Augustine. That's where St. Augustine learnt a lot of his theology. Okay. And the other man that is mentioned is a man called Victorinus. Victorinus used to be a pagan philosopher. And this pagan philosopher and Simplician, Victorinus and Simplician, they, they knew one another. And Victorinus, the pagan guy, had read the New Testament and was convinced that it was true. And whenever he spoke with Simplician, and Simplician would try to uh, give him the gospel and tell him about Christ, Victorinus would say, I'm already a Christian. But he wasn't part of the church. I'm already a Christian. And Simplician said these words to him. He said, I don't believe you. Nor will I count you, nor will I count you among the Christians unless I see you in the church of Christ. To which Victorinus would laughingly reply, do walls make Christians? Do I have to be part of, do I have to be in a building in order to be a Christian? Which is what so many people say today. Things haven't changed. Do I have to go to a building in order to be a Christian? Of course not. That's not what Simplician meant. That's not what Augustine meant. That's not what I mean. That's the, none of us believe that. There is no one who believes that you become a Christian by being inside four walls. That's not the point. The point is, if you're a Christian, you need to identify with the people of God. You have to say, okay, this is the church of Christ and I am part of it. I'm not a lone sheep somewhere wandering by myself. I'm part of a flock. I'm not some stone that's just thrown off into the field. I'm part of a temple. I'm not a severed limb somewhere. I'm part of a body. I'm not an orphan. I'm not a child wandering off on my own. I'm part of a family. That's the point, not being in four walls. And when someone says, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not part of that. You just throw out half the Bible because that's what you do. You gather with God's people, become a family and worship together. Join a Bible believing church, go to church gatherings and you will be blessed. Let's pray.